as you guys may have known, I, um, Greg or Greg Sofer, yeah. Greg, mm -hmm. originally came up to a presentation I did at Salt Lake Design Week on um, um, sketching, and it was really based a lot around um, teams and how you get your team to get more engaged. So I think it's actually going to be great that we have uh, a couple different backgrounds here today. Uh, really, to let you guys know a little bit about me, I work for a company called Infusionsoft. We're actually based out of Chandler, Arizona, but we have an office here in Lehigh, Utah. Um, of course, we're in Utah. Um, so I'm a senior product designer there over our new, our research and development products that are going on. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I post something there once a month or so. But there you go, it's pretty easy, Jeff Carter UX. So just so I can get a little feel, I'd love to hear what you get, what your degrees are, what you're doing in school, and what you're hoping to do after school. Would like to start, anyone can go. Front row. All right. I'm studying <coughs> graphic design. I hope to graduate in April. Nice. Apply for graduation, so I hope it happens. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just kind of found UX UI a few semesters ago as they started kind of making it more apparent in the graphic design field. So I'm just looking for internships and kind of starting in that direction. Sweet. This is my wife. Your wife? Yeah. You're studying UX too, I assume, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I graduated with a degree in sociology. So. Perfect for UX. I know. We look for those people all the time. I'm going to be our researchers. UX is, uh, I always say, it's a mix of sociology and design mm -hmm. and government behavior. Yeah. Perfect. I'm actually doing design research in the sociology department. Okay. Oh, there you go. I'm actually <laughs> sure graduating by year. Perfect. I graduated and I just started here as a UI designer. Perfect. Yeah, one, so. Nice. Well, welcome. I'm an IT major studying uh, user experience design. Um, I'm not graduating in April. Perfect. And after that, um, I'm a full time. Figure it out. Great. This is my I'm a civil engineer. I graduated with my master's this summer. So. Nice. Good to have these wives done with school before the guys. That's how it worked with me, too. Um, so, today, like I said uh, before, this is not a presentation, so feel free to ask questions. As we go through, I always want these to be presented as a workshop. I think it could be very interactive because I think it's really boring just listening to someone talk for an hour. Um, so yeah, feel free to contribute your thoughts. Um, I'll, I will set this up a little at the beginning just to let you kind of know what we, wow, what we will be talking about today. Um, and I think the very first thing that I want to kind of talk about is that sketching is a, is a baseline element of UX. Um, I don't know how many of you are into sports. But a lot of the analogies that I found about why you should study sketching kind of come from the sports industry. So if, you, if any of you know Vince Lombardi, he's very famous for saying, gentlemen, this is a football. He's talking to his football players, and he goes over the football, the size, how big it is, how much it should be inflated, why there's string on it. Uh, take you out to the football field and say, here's the dimensions. Um, and you just go over a lot of the basics. And it was really interesting because it became very famous for that because people started getting back to the basics, remembering how a ball would fly through the air, why it's shaped the way it is. And I think a lot of times we get too much into distant concepts and we try and think so much that we forget the baseline skills. There's actually, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with um, Jared Spool, he's one of the main thought leaders. He put out this um, article about, uh, I don't remember how long it's been. It's, it's been within the last six months. It was kind of funny, I went to dinner with him when he was in town for one of his conferences. And um, he was telling us all about pra about baseball practice. And I was like, that's kind of weird, what are you talking about? And then he puts this article out, 
And I thought it was really interesting where he started talking about Alex Rodriguez, and he says, Major League Baseball's highest paid player, Alex Rodriguez, does the same thing every lesser paid, paid player does. He practices. He practices hitting the ball, throwing, catching, and building. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting when you start thinking about he's actually uh, practicing all the time. He is so good, but why is he still practicing? Um, I'll set this up here in a minute. So um, the other thing that I think is really important, he says, drawing the same design elements or screens repeatedly teaches our muscles to sketch quicker. Um, you'll kind of see this slide. I borrowed this slide a whole bunch of times as we go through because it really shows a lot of kind of what the baseline of what we're going to be talking about today is. And I think we'll pause here. We'll get where it's perfect sound for the agenda. So let's pause, grab some food, and you guys can eat while I set up a little bit more and then we'll get busy sketching. So all these exercises, so when I originally did this um, in Salt Lake Design Week, we took a full hour and a half to go through all these exercises. So some of the exercises I'll just tell you about and you'll be able to go do them on your own um, to kind of get, uh, so you can keep practicing when we're done. So today, the one thing I want you to, to keep in mind is how could my team or I benefit from doing these exercises? Like I say, originally this was set up to go and teach your team members. You'll find when you start getting into the industry, there aren't a lot of standards around how sketches, sketching is done, how terminology is worded. So there's gonna be a lot of things here that you'll wanna keep in mind for the future when you go out. So let's talk about the sketch. So for those of you who have a process at this point, where does sketching live in your design process? It's in the beginning, but I think I mostly use it throughout everything. So you're in the middle of a project where you get a new idea or something. I kind of like to sketch out just to kind of put it on paper and see how it fits in, but primarily most people get to start. Okay. Anyone different than that? I think it's like just like, just like another thought tool. Like it's a thought tool for all the way through the process. That's what you use it for should change to the process, but it should be there the whole time if that's what works for you and your, and your brain works. Yeah. No, that's a perfect. You guys kind of already hit on it. A lot of times you'll see those fancy infographics that someone puts out that says, my design process, and it's, they try and be different than someone else. But a lot of times you see the first step as their sketching phase, and then they go to wireframes and interactions and visuals. <laughs> but like you guys said, which was said perfectly, that first stage is really ideation. Sketch is gonna be something you use across the board, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about how sketching looks in some of these different areas, because it's not always the same, even though it's the same tool. So what is a sketch good for? Anyone gonna finish the song for me? There you go, <laughs> absolutely nothing. No, it's, as soon as I put that big, that line in there, I said, do I keep it in there or is someone gonna finish the song? I'm glad somebody got my joke. <laughs> so thank you for the humor there. So I put three different things that sketching is good. So the, fir so the first being brainstorming. A lot of times we don't think of, of sketching as a brainstorming activity, but how many times have you been on a whiteboard and you started drawing boxes and words and decision maps. And then you realize, well, that is a form of sketching. Sketching is a way of communicating with somebody else. So are you getting ideas out? Are you, it always doesn't need to be an interface. It doesn't need to be um, something that you could turn into an interface or code. It could be simply deciding which path is the user gonna go through. And that kind of goes right into the next one of communication. A lot of times we don't just sketch on a whiteboard by ourselves. It might be in a meeting. It might be through collaboration. But we're really going out there and trying to communicate our ideas with somebody else. So it's, it's not just going to be you that's seeing it. And the last can be storytelling. One, of the, one thing that I have really pushed my team on is that you never come to a design meeting 
with final sketches or even baseline sketches. Because how often, and with some of you not having worked, when you get out there and you bring a sketch like this into a meeting and you want to start talking about it, someone will say, oh, well, what's this little line down here? Or what's that panel over there? And all of a sudden, your presentation went from, I was trying to tell you my idea and get it out in a, in a cohesive manner, and all of a sudden you jumped around the whole interface. People are super confused. So sketching is really good. If we break this down and pretend I'm up here on the board and I say, hey, you know, we're gonna need uh, our logo in the left-hand navigation pattern. We're gonna have a top nav, but it's gonna be really thin, maybe just our search. And when someone comes to, let's say, a page with a whole bunch of items, we're gonna have those items right next to the nav, left nav. And when you click on one of those, let's say the top one, it populates this information, you talk about the information, and let's say you click on something else in there and want to get even more little panel slides in. Now all of a sudden you've kind of told your story and people understand what all the components are for, rather than just coming with a final sketch and saying, hey, this is my idea. Something my art director said once when I was on a UX team is just like clients have no imagination. Because like so if you show them like if you show your team a wireframe that you did or like a mock-up, that's they don't see the potential in it. It's like that they see it as that and that's when they get caught up on the details. And thinking about that helps me all the time, like, oh would I want someone to see this and think it was a finished project? No. So I'd rather yep. keep working on like the storytelling and like selling them on the idea of it rather than like the color scheme. Yeah. It's helped a lot. Yeah, and that, it's very true. Like, we recently just showed some wireframes of, at work to a bunch of different people, and all of a sudden the meeting just deteriorated, and what was supposed to be an hour presentation turned into a three-hour meeting of arguing and whatnot. So we went back and started building the story a little bit different, and the next meeting was like 30 minutes. And I was like, oh, we're all on board. This is the same thing we were showing you before, so it can definitely be a good way of doing it, being more storytelling and building the story a little bit better for me. So what tools do you guys like to use when you sketch? Okay, what else? You got a pencil? I've used everything from napkins, Nutella, pencils, Paper. <laughs> okay. Whiteboards. Yeah. What's that? Index cards. Index cards. Yep. Yeah. Great for like the purple is the perfect side. Perfect. Yeah. I really just enjoy just drawing on a whiteboard. Just <clears throat> it gets me out out of my chair and kind of like doing something I'm thinking about things in a different way. So I really. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. I have. When I presented this at um, Salt Lake Design Week, when I got done, one of my old bosses came up to me. He's like, when I saw your name next to a sketching workshop, I was very hesitant because when I got done with school, my sketching was horrendous, like completely horrible. And I was like, you know, I'm never going to sketch another thing in my life. I'm just going to go straight to whatever. I was an industrial designer, so I was like, I'll just start building SOLIDWORKS models, and it'll be fine. I'll figure it all out in there. Um, and then it was interesting. I got to my first job, and my boss loved whiteboards. Like, absolutely loved them. We had them everywhere. And one thing that I learned personally about myself is when it's in a book, my brain would freeze up because it's permanent, right? Like a book is something you read and people enjoy, but on a whiteboard, who cares how good it looks? Like be creative, be sketching. Um, and I think that's something all of us personally need to identify. I'm not here to say that this is the good way of doing it, but find what way works best for you. If you need to go to the Provo newspaper and buy newspaper rolls and just sketch on that because you can throw it away, if it's a whiteboard, if you do love books or napkins or whatever, find what works best for you. I think one thing too many people think is that there should be some kind of standard. But to go back to Jared Spool's um, article and you start thinking about a baseball player, can you imagine if the baseball, these professional baseball players showed up and they said, here, you all have to use the same bat. You all have to use the same glove. 
I would never fly. Everybody likes personal things because it caters to their skill sets a little bit different. And it's not any different with uh, UX and when you get out. So what do I love? If I'm on paper, I'm always these dual tip Sharpies, and I love these pen Sharpies. And I'll show you why here I'm at. And on a whiteboard, I love the thin ones. I hate these big fat ones. Every time I see one, I just want to throw them in the garbage. But I know some people love them, so I don't. And the reason I love them is for different reasons. So here you can see that when I sketch, I sketch everything in black that is um, the actual interface. And then when I call things out, I do it in a color. So that way, when I present it to someone, I'm not saying, well, is this arrow text that floats outside of the interface? I know that sounds like a dumb question, but it's been asked plenty of times. Um, and it's the same when I'm on a whiteboard. I almost never just do everything in one color. I like to have multiple colors. And um, I even got to a point in my last company where everybody had a different colored marker. So whether we were coloring on paper or on the whiteboard, everyone had their own color. So if I got up there and sketched something out, and then one of my coworkers came and sketched next to it, we could see whose ideas came from where. So later in the discussion, if you decided, hey, I really like this idea, whose was it and where was it going? We kind of knew which brain to go back to. So there's a lot of benefits to really understanding what tools and how you can apply those to the way um, you're using it in your sketching. And to show you guys how weird I am with my sketching, here's a picture of my desk. So you can see I have some of those fat markers. That was before I bought some of the thin ones. But I'm so weird, I made them buy me my own whiteboard. And that was the cheap one. Like this one is actually glass, and you can see I taped paper on the back of it because I wanted my own whiteboard that bad. And finally one day the boss manager came in and said, that looks like John, let's just go buy you one. Um, but it really taught me something about at least the company I work for is that they know that whatever tools you need to be successful saves them a lot of money. So maybe that new whiteboard costs 300, 400 bucks. If they get more innovative products that they can sell, then that 400 bucks was worth it. So I think it's definitely worth finding out what works best for you and get those tools no matter what it takes. And if you need to, tell them about baseball players. These are now I actually. Yeah. yeah, if you guys ever want a standing desk, that's a good one. All my coworkers think I'm weird though, because I stand half the day and then sit half the day. So I have two monitors so I can just switch the input and stand or sit. All right, now is the time for you guys to sketch away. We're gonna do a few drills. These are, these are um, actually ways, like with Jared's pool, that he wants you to create that muscle memory, doing something over and over again. And again, I told you the quote would be coming up again. So drawing the same design elements or, or scenes repeatedly teaches our muscles to sketch quicker. So we're going to go through a few of these, do them somewhat fast. And like I said, if you want to do it on paper, I've got plenty of paper up here. You guys can take a pen if you need it. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of exercises. So here we go with the first. So first we're going to draw some lines. Um, on a piece of paper, start at one side. You can determine the length you want to do. But just see how many lines similar to this. Just one after another. Try and start and stop in the same spot. Not make us do like the two dots thing where you try to connect the dots perfectly. That's another great way of doing it. But yeah, just this one. Try and just go start and stop at approximately the same spot on each line. You can determine how long it is. And now that you're getting a few on the page, uh, one one um, way of doing it was just said you can put two dots, um, kind of like here where you put one down and try and draw to the other. So you're trying to start and stop. Another way is um, when you sketch, try putting the pen down and look at the end here. 
and then pull it to where you're looking. I had a coworker when I was talking to him about this presentation. He said it's kind of like when you um, are pulling up what it was a hay he was talking about. Like if you want those rows to be straight, farmers, they don't look down at where they're currently at. They look at a fixed point and just drive straight towards it. Like mowing. Yep, we're mowing your yard. If you want straight lines, look where you're going, not down at the grass. Um, same thing with drawing a line. Put your pen down, look where you want to go, and get there. It's also quicker to do lines, so try and just do them fast, don't think about them. So don't be too worried if they stop. This is really something you should try and, um, and do on a regular basis. Um, I recommend, at least with my design team, that we do this every time before we start going into a brainstorm session. So that you get your arm warmed up and going. Next, we're gonna do some circles. This is always the fun one, right? So just draw circles of all sorts of different sizes all over your page. So I wish I had like a really cool trick on how to draw circles. But how, what methods do you guys use to draw circles? Anything you've learned over time? Yeah, and just was I used to talk like draw from your shoulder, not your wrist. Okay. So that's a great one. If you if you feel your fingers moving too much on a circle, it's usually harder. But if you can get like your arm going, you tend to do them. Another thing in industrial design they teach you is to ghost it. So get your arm moving, and then finally put the pen down. So you, you are above the paper, and then once you feel like you're going in enough circles, put that sucker down. Do you draw left to right or right to left? I do counter. Yeah, some people do it. Some people are from bottom around. Some people are at the top. Um, IDEO, if you guys ever want to look up something really cool, they have um, sketch aerobics. And they actually get it where you're getting your whole body into it <laughs> and doing stuff. And then they just have you drawing big circles. Really cool. There's a lot of different ways to learn how to warm up. Um, but these skills are really good for a couple different reasons. Next, we're gonna do some squares. So don't worry about if it's square, you can do rectangles, squares, boxes, whatever you wanna call them. So squares and rectangles, just put a bunch out there. Now do you want us to have one continuous line or do you want, does it matter? However you wanna do a box, yep. Oh yeah? So it's down over, yep. And funny. <laughs> what kind of Chinese do you know? Okay. I know Cantonese, so. I know enough Mandarin to get myself in trouble. I took a class here, and they found out I spoke Cantonese, and I got in trouble. So I was supposed to take a different Mandarin class. So as you put a few of these boxes down, Start evaluating and see if your boxes look like one of these three. So you have a couple different ones. You have the around the world, where you've gotten that all the way around. You have the perspective box, which you thought you were doing it, but now it looks like you put it in perspective because your lines don't match up. Or you have the traditional Chinese, where you get the rounded corner, right? <laughs> Just because that's how Chinese you write them. So these are the three most common um, boxes that aren't exactly 100% square. So if we go back to the very first exercise where I had you guys draw lines, like that might seem pretty boring, but when you start thinking about um, how to draw a box, if you're drawing your first line and then you have your starting point go to the end, your starting point go to the end, now all of a sudden that exercise where we're practicing starting and stopping is gonna make your boxes look a lot straighter and are gonna, as you do that line thing, you're gonna get used to making lines parallel rather than converging or diverging. So that's just a little trick on how to uh, help your boxes a little bit. 
So now that we've done those warm up, how can you guys see that these this would help you with your sketching? Those are all the shapes you need when you're wireframing. Yep. It kind of makes you excited about sketching. Like you don't really see it as like an exercise or something that you know you're going to get better at, so to speak. Kind of makes it exciting and realize that sketching actually is a hard skill and not just you know something that you have to do. Yeah, exactly. Because it makes your lines have more feel. If you do it a lot, they won't look shaky. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it communicates a lot better, too. It's a lot easier to, to really understand something when you're not trying to make out what it is. And then you're, they can look past that and you actually communicate what you're trying to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. When, especially as you start studying interaction design. Like, if we go back to that box that is a perspective box, a lot of times we'll sketch that on purpose to show that it's a card flip or it's an actual interaction going on. So if all of a sudden you can't draw a square, someone might say, oh, it, your whole page flips? No, I just can't draw straight lines. <laughs> so it's, uh, it starts get bringing in different concepts depending on where, where you work. Uh, some places don't do a lot of interaction or interactive flipping and whatnot, so it doesn't matter, but it's just, it's been interesting over my career to start seeing what different sketches mean. And someone will draw something they so you want that to flip? No? Oh, you want to do something else. Um, and that really goes into this next section, is a sketch language. Uh, this is something, I don't know if it's unique to um, myself, but it's something that I've really focused in on over my career. It's starting to help people understand each other through sketching. So, how many of you here speak 10 words of another language? You can at least go on to regular TV and hear a little Spanish and understand. How many of you here are fluent in another language? Maybe half of us? <laughs> so, is there anyone here that does not understand Spanish at all? That's that's a rough Spanish. <laughs> so the reason I ask is I put this sentence in here. Mi nombre es Juan. Right? That's poor Spanish because I don't speak Spanish. I know I took enough in high school to understand the basics. And so I actually translated this for you guys who don't speak very much Spanish. It's my number is one. Right? <laughs> So when we start talking about spoken language, like this doesn't come over as like it's me being silly, right? We all know that that probably doesn't say my number is one. But if you start interpreting this into a, a UI, like how close is me and my? How close is nombre and number? Like you start seeing that there's these visual differences, but they actually mean a lot different when you actually know what it's saying. Um, so it can be interpreted interpreted a lot different. And even if you didn't see it and I just said it, well maybe my Spanish is broken enough that it really sounds like this because I don't have the right accent. And um, a lot of people don't understand that that's how um, UX works. Because a lot of times you'll say things in a way of, hey, we need to do this modal, and someone has a completely different context than maybe you're talking about toast that pops up from the bottom. So there's a lot of different ways that people can interpret what you're saying. And so um, what I've kind of done is start to put a process together for my design team to go through so that we can start to speak the same language. So the first thing we're going to do is I want you to grid out the boxes, now that you guys know how to draw boxes, make the same kind of grid and then sketch one of each of these in those boxes. So just do it real quick, don't overthink it. And don't feel pressure, there's no right or wrong answers here. If you're 
pen's not working, I can grab you another one. You need a different one? These trade show pens aren't always the best. How are we doing? Does someone have at least four or five done for the most part? All right, now comes, and you can finish these later if you want, but share the sketches that you have with the person next to you. Yep. Yeah, you can cool. slide back with them and see. Conversations. How many of you drew the exact same thing as everyone else in your group? By the raise of hands. One of them is the same. Progress card. Okay. How many of you started talking about what some of these words meant? Okay. Heard a little bit of that going on. So going back to these, who knows what a combo box is? Sounds like a happy meal. You stole my joke. That was gonna be my joke is you find combo boxes at KFC. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, either or. What do you mean? If you're in the app store and uh, iTunes like at the top, it's you know they're like one side, like it's gonna be one or the other, one's gonna be on. Okay, so combo box meaning it's turned on or off. Okay. Yeah, you're displaying it. Okay. What other ideas? Yeah. Is it? It's like I'm picturing kind of like a drop down, but instead of like drop down, it's just like a list of different options, and you can like click on them. Sometimes like you can move them over to another copy box. Like okay. What other ideas? Yeah. You know when I tried to use the word combo box, it's more of like a search combined with the drop down, where you can search and you get stuck. Options to pick them, but. Okay. So I put that one in on purpose because who knows what it means? It's used in so many different categories. I think you guys all kind of hit on different ways that it can be used. And this really is going to start going to, um, as you learn as a designer, different terminology, the rest of the industry might not use it the same way you do. Um, it really starts coming down. Um, to how do the people around you use the terminology. So for a long time, at my last company, we worked um, on all these things called modals, which was basically a screen that laid over whatever you were on, you did your action, and then closed it. Well then, Frog Design came, and they started calling all of them toasts. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird. 
And then later I learned that material design actually introduced toast, meaning it raises from the bottom. You do your thing and then it slides down. Like toast, right? But frog design had used it different than how Google created the terminology originally. And then my company called it a modal. So it's really gonna start affecting like who you're around and how do they use that terminology. So as you start thinking about this type of, of interactions with the people you're around, talking the same language, if we go back to my, my number is one, like your number is one, that's great, but what does that have to do with this? It starts bringing it a little more into context of what languages are the people around you speaking. So there's a good chance that when you guys sketch, they look something like this. There may have been some that were kind of close and others that were completely different because it counter meant something to you based on interactions that you've had in the past. You have to think how long is it going to be. Um, you start understanding that from a deeper muscle memory and always having to think about it. So to kind of show you the benefits of this, we're actually going to all draw in the same language. So you don't get to deviate from this. You don't get to put your own spin on it. We're gonna draw a modal with those three components in it. The components don't have to be in it, but all of these fit inside of this area. So go ahead and draw the modal and those things in there exactly as they are. How are we doing? Are we getting there? Okay, we're probably good. We might not have all the elements. Almost there? Yeah. All right. All right, we can finish these up. So now I want you to show the people next to you, and if you're not done, just go ahead and show them again and see how close you guys catch this time. I'd love for you to show your, <laughs> your family. I know, but just show them your model. No, you're okay. Just go ahead and show them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how much closer do your sketches look this time? So they start looking closer, right? And remind me what your major was again. We have a sociology person. How close did your model look to mine? Like the same, right? <laughs> it's pretty easy, like when you start thinking, hey, we're as a group, we're always going to sketch an action bar this way. Later, we'll go in and identify what icons or if it has text. Let's not worry about that. But while we're brainstorming today, all action bars are going to look the same way. And as you start building out a language with your, um, with your team or even with yourself, you start being able to sketch things quicker because you're not having to think about what they look like every time. Um, I think this is a, actually really important as new designers because if you know that your action bar always looks the same and you go back to your sketches later, you actually know what they mean. 
instead of going back and what was I trying to do here? I know I was doing something cool, but I have no clue. Yeah. Maybe we'll get to this, but um, just like I didn't know what a mobile was before I switched up. So like, is there are there places online or like any resources you recommend where you can get kind of familiar with all the different names there? I know the different names you use places, but just yep. kind of like a glossary of sorts. Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways. The best is just go look up style guides. Go look up Uber style guide, look up um, Google's material design. Um, if any of you have ever used Balsamic, one thing that we love to do, and how some of our junior designers got started, we actually had them go into Balsamic, and they have all the elements that you can pull onto the page. See what those are named and how they sketched them out. It's kind of an easy way if you have no clue what some things are called. If you don't know what a date picker looks like, go find one in Balsamic. And it'll roughly show you how to sketch it. You can start developing your own sketch style that way. Um, but as far as my team goes, we're all trying to move to the exact same style. So even though it isn't our unique way, we can go into a meeting and understand what each other is saying. And I think a great example of this is I was in a meeting with one of our junior designers the other day and we're sketching ideas on the board and he's sketching something and I'm sketching something. When we get done, we're talking about it. And I said, well, where's your header? He's like, well, it's this line right here. Well, all of my text, I usually do like a little squiggly line instead of actually putting text. Well, just for that brief moment, we had to stop our ideation because we sketched elements and we had to get clarity. But you can imagine if we spoke that same language we wouldn't have had to have stopped to ask basic questions on where's your head or what is this box? Is that an image? Is it an icon? When you start speaking the same language, it not only increases understanding, it also helps the speed that, you're, that you'll be doing these. Um, so we already shared them. I'm hoping they looked a lot closer. I hope you guys are giving me a hard time. So how do you guys see this, other than what I've already said, how do you see this applying either to yourself or to a team you might be on? I think that's really helpful because it's easier to combine ideas. Because um, like on other teams, if you have two completely different sketching styles, it's harder to, if you like something from this piece something this piece, it's harder to bring them together into one piece of design. But if I was in the same style, it becomes incredibly easy to combine ideas and match up ideas and move them around, cut them up. Yeah, that's a great it's point. It's easier for them to imagine what you're thinking. What's this one? I think it promotes efficiency and clarity. You, know, you guys are on the same line frame. You guys don't have to be bogged down with just already being on the same base of understanding. You can actually talk about what's at hand instead of having to just spend an extra 10, 15, 20 minutes just to try to figure out what we're trying to say first. Yeah. So one thing that's really great to look up if you guys want to look it up sometime is look up cognitive load. So usually this is done with interfaces of how much the person has to remember as they're going through your interface. But start thinking about that from a sketch session. Like if you, if the cognitive load is so heavy of them trying to interpolate what your sketch means, they don't have that brain capacity to start thinking of it, to start riffing on your idea. So the closer you can get those, you can use that brain power for something else because you already understand what the sketch is. So there's a lot of concepts as you start thinking about the way you brainstorm, the way you communicate. There's other areas like cognitive load that you can start pulling in. So I think those are great points you guys brought up. Um, this last section gets really long um, as far as sketching. So I'll probably, you guys can take notes on it and try it for yourself later. But it's really starting to come into what sketch fidelity should you use when you're um, going through the different parts of your design process. So the first is quick iteration. And actually we're going to do this first step because I think it's really fun. And I, I love every time I've done it. But it's draw five boxes. So make groupings of five boxes. I'll have you guys actually do this. But put five boxes in any format you want. They can overlap, they can, they can run however you want. But we're gonna see how many you guys can do in two minutes. So as fast as you can, don't evaluate them, don't worry, just go. Five boxes in a group. See how many you can crank out.
wish this stage was lower so I could get down and watch you guys. Okay, one more minute. seconds. Five seconds. And stop. All right, count how many full Complete group of five that you have. And write the number somewhere and circle it. That's you practicing your circles. Hopefully you did good at practicing your circles early, right? Okay. I have curiosity, who got more than five? More than ten. More than fifteen. Okay. So now do it faster. You have to beat your what number you just circled. So get more out, just crank through them as fast as you can. Like you can repeat if you want, but just try and just crank a different group of them. Is it okay if someone does What's that? Is someone who does Yeah, just crank them out. Ready? Yeah, I don't know what's wrong with those things. Yeah, go for it. Oh. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Fast, fast, fast. The pressure. Try and beat your old record, go fast. Thirty seconds. Really quickly getting worse and worse. Just keep cranking. Just go, go, go. Fifteen more seconds. Five more seconds. Oh, and the butt broke. <laughs> okay, that's the time. So now count up how many you got this time. Okay, how many? Who improved by at least one? Sweet, at least everybody. How about five? You want to improve by five? Ten? Fifteen? All right. 
<laughs> so what what's the purpose of this this uh, exercise? Why would we do this? how much you were evaluating them when I told you, just sketch them out, just go. Like, you, you can't forget that evaluation. And a lot of times as, as we're in the UX process, we start, every time there's boxes, we think it's an interface, right? Like, I don't know how many times you guys have ever been to, kind of like menus, I always look at them and I'm like, they've got them in boxes. I could turn this and blow up. Like, I start thinking of weird things all the time. Or my son the other day was drawing just boxes, my little four-year-old. I was like, oh, that would be kind of a cool image slider. Like, wait a second, this, he's not even drawing that. So sometimes we start evaluating ideas before they're even ideas, right? We start evaluating, does my box look pretty? I bet if we came and evaluated your boxes on that last one, they're probably not the pretty ones we drew before, right? You probably have more rounded corners, probably more perspective boxes. And when you're in the ideation phase, there's nothing wrong with that. You're trying to crank out ideas as quick as possible. You're not trying to evaluate, is the sketch look good? Is it, is it really something I put on my fridge at home with a gold star on it? So at that phase, you're really just trying to get ideas out as, as quick as possible. The next section is, this is when we start adding a little more detail. So what I'd normally have you guys do, and since we're short on time, we'll kind of skip this, but normally I'd have you pick like three that you actually um, really like, maybe that you don't understand that they're an interface, but just combination of the boxes. So you guys can look at yours and start seeing are there three that are drastically different, but you kind of like at least how they look. So these, I just randomly pick some of the ones I've done before. And from there, this is where your language system comes in. We can say, hey, you need to use an action bar now, an accordion, and a video player. So put those three in the three that you selected. They might not fit, they might not be traditional, but they're gonna start giving you at least a little bit different read. So when you start looking at that, one of yours might go from this to a little bit more detail. So now I've put in, um, maybe this is a breadcrumb. I don't know what that means. This is an action bar. Maybe this is my video player. And all of a sudden you can maybe see an interface that you might not have traditionally sketched because you're putting elements into just a concept, just an idea, something you didn't evaluate. Um, too often when we're starting to get to the more detail, we go straight back to this is YouTube. This is how YouTube does it. This is how Vimeo does it. This is how all the traditional places do it. But they might be wrong. Just because they're highly successful doesn't mean they're a good user experience. Um, people may have just gotten used to how crappy something is. And now it's all of a sudden <laughs> become standard. And you actually, it's fine to joke about that, but man, there's so many good examples. Apple's a perfect one. There's so many things you can start looking at that their interface is really weird. Um, and we start thinking about how um, people flow through applications. What's Apple recently done? They put this tiny little thing up at the top. I don't know if you guys have gone from like your email to another app mm -hmm. or to a Chrome. And they put this tiny little text up there so you can go back, which is what Android's been doing for a long time, right? So just because a company's successful doesn't mean they, um, they have the best user experience. So it's, all, it's nice to pull examples but sometimes just go be creative because you might find out that there's a better flow or a better way of doing something. 
from here is where I have you pick like the one that really feels like an interface and one you might want to build. And you would actually take that and start putting in more details. So you, you put examples. This ended up being a filter, not a breadcrumb. And maybe it's weird having the filter on the bottom, but you can start making those evaluations because you're at that point in your process. You can see what would we actually put in our accordion? What does this mean? Is that a category? Is it a genre? Is it, what does that mean? You can start having that evaluation where if we would started sketching and I said, all right, sketch a, a YouTube-like interface with different categories. You may have started here and started evaluating it right from the beginning and couldn't get onto another idea. So the reason I have you guys, would have you guys do these um, in this pattern is so you can just crank out ideas, get them out there as fast as possible without having to evaluate them. Um, I'd normally have you guys share this, so later if you guys want to do it. But here's the example. We went from something that I didn't evaluate. Now I'm going to start putting some more detail in. Okay, I still really like it. Now I'll put in final detail, and I can have that evaluation of the idea. Was it really that good? But I started somewhere innovative instead of starting somewhere that maybe pigeonholed me into an idea too quick. So this is really some if you guys need to get a lot of ideas out. This is a great process to really get your brain flowing that way. So how does this look in the design process we talked about? We took, I, we took Sketch out of the, that first step and just called it ideation. So when you think of that quick iteration that we did, that's really what you're doing, is you're ideating. You're not trying to come up with the perfect solution the first time. You're just trying to brain dump. Get as many ideas out as possible without evaluating them. Uh, maybe you might not start with the five box method. You might go straight into a little bit deeper interfaces because some of them we saw were like five squares in a diagonal. You're probably never going to do that for an interface. So there are some of those you can start evaluating to at least not start with. But here you're just trying to get those out as fast as possible. Um, once you've gotten ideas out, this is where you can start evaluating them, putting in a little more detail on your wireframes, you're probably gonna put a little higher detail, a little higher thought. Your interactions, you might think if they flip or slide or do different interactions. And then lastly, you do your final details. You're putting, when you get to that more visual, whether it's hi-fi or almost hi-fi section, you're actually going in and saying, the icon is this. Instead of, um, in my sketch language, an icon always starts as a cross circle. That's, it always represents an icon. A square with an X and it always means an image. Um, but at that last stage, I would actually go in and say, all right, we're going to have some volume control that looks weird, like my last, that was our, sorry, this was my last logo that I always thought looked like a volume control. But you can start putting that detail in at the end. You don't need to worry about it right at the beginning. So from just seeing those three different levels of fidelity, how do you guys feel that could, other than what I've said, how could that apply to either yourselves or teams at your own? I think I mentioned this before, but like when you present like a finished sketch right off the bat, it kind of limits your creativity to everything else. Mm -hmm. The kind of teams they worked on, like, with, as soon as we were all ideating, and someone would go full blown and just sketch, like, the entire, every little detail on the page, and suddenly that was our reference point, even though maybe it wasn't the best. And so, we're, like, working through the process all together, you're all coming to, like, the best solution every time rather than, like, oh, that works, we'll just keep working after that because it's done, yeah. even though it's not the best. Yeah. Other ideas? I feel like it also helps you. Um, answer some of the more basic questions about what you want to do with the application and stuff because you're not that invested in a specific look. So you can easily change um, kind of its purpose or the flow or something when you're just bare bones um, rather than when you are kind of have a high fidelity and like she was saying, you're kind of stuck with mm -hmm. so. so if I came in today and said, man, that third set of boxes you did, it's horrible. Like, how invested are you in those boxes at this point? Mm -hmm. You're not, right? Because you know you got them out as quick as possible. 
there's not that emotional investment. Where a lot of times what we see um, with people who are new in UX, or even some that have been in it for a long time, they sketch something and it becomes a reality. They cannot get past that first sketch. They've fallen in love with it and they've become defenders of that idea. And they won't move off of it. Or if you start thinking about this where you've gone through this iterative process, you might get to one that looks like, oh, oh I went the wrong direction. Like, my end product might be this. I might never do it that way. And so I have no emotional attachment at that point, right? I've kind of gotten some new ideas and new concepts out, but I don't have to defend that because I might see one of yours and think, well, that's so much better than mine. Like I got pigeonholed in a bad one and I have no attachment. So it's really being able to, as a designer, as whatever role you want to be, as a researcher, if you get pulled in, don't be attached. There's so many concepts out there. And that's why being as a team, having that language, that sketch language, you can start, you can ideate a lot quicker than the example is given up of, if I put this up there and said, all right guys, let's ideate off of my sketch, I'm guessing most of them in here wouldn't look that dissimilar. Or there'd be the wild child in here that would wanna go like clear out on a different island. Um, and so you get something that's just completely wacky. But there's a lot of benefit to, to understanding the fidelity and where you're at in the process. So just to wrap it up, because I know we're over time, is um, again, think about what a sketch is good for. What are you going to use it for? Um, kind of the core skills that we talked about today. Create a sketch language, even if it's just for yourself. Learn how to draw the same thing over and over again so you get that muscle memory. And then think about what fidelity do you need your sketch in. You need it to really be as hi-fi, or can you get away with just random boxes with maybe a little bit of text? And that is the presentation. Any thoughts or questions you guys have about anything today? Yeah. I have one. So, um, is there a specific way that you do to share the sketch language with other people? Kind of like, do you have it, and someone or people can reference it if they forget it? No. Like especially if they're trying to read the sketch. Yeah, so the way um, we've done it is we actually had everyone conduct it. I brought in all the sketches and we kind of said, all right, we want this one, this one, this one, this one to mean these different things. And then I actually took them into Illustrator and if you notice the ones I had up here were really clean. That's because I cleaned them up in Illustrator. So made them into vectors, cleaned them up real nice. And then we actually print out the pages and so when we pull in a product manager or a researcher or a developer who maybe hasn't sketched that much, we say, hey, we're going to use these ones today because we know we're going to be working on modal. If you need to put any other things in, here, here's what they roughly look like. Now, it doesn't always happen, and there's going to be a learning curve where you're going to have these people that can't ideate very quick because they're trying to reference the cheat sheet. But over time, if you get them in the habit of it, then, as soon, then later they might not um, be sketching with you, but if they understand, oh, I see his sketch and this is an action bar, then all of a sudden it helps them be quicker. So we, we do little cheat sheets for them. Yeah. Um, as far as like starting out in the field, if you, um, or like sketching out and throwing out your ideas. How do you, um, you have to be very humble in like letting your ideas be thrown out. How do you like feel like you're progressing, I guess, the, like it, as you start out in ideas and things like that? So how do you feel uh, like you're progressing? Yeah, I mean, like I, I figure like those that have gone through it a lot, like your, <clears throat> their sketches will tend to rise to the top just because they have gone through the process a little bit more and like they have done it more. Like how do you, I guess, stand out? How do you stand out? That's a, actually a great point. So it's all gonna depend on the environment you're in. Um, the type of team that I've started to mold our team towards is that nobody gets an idea. 
So no idea is anybody. So if we leave the room, it's no one saying, hey, I, my sketch got selected, I'm the great one. And so we actually do something called 10 by 10s. Um, there's lots of different names for it. But the base idea is that we come in, we sketch for 10 minutes, get ideas out, post them up on the wall, everyone explains it, and then you actually go back and sketch, and you can borrow anybody's idea. So if you liked merging in, and I think that's one thing for um, younger designers or people getting into the UX industry, is don't worry if it's your idea. Worry about how good the idea is. And I think the more you do that, it, even though it might be a senior designer's idea or someone else's, you're probably still gonna work on it. And so the more that you can free your mind from trying to prove yourself to saying, I'm going to be iterative and I'm gonna come up with a lot of ideas, then you start finding the quality of your work gets better because you start borrowing of, well, I always like filters this way, so I'm gonna defend myself. But you see a senior do it, say, that's actually a good idea. And then you start borrowing that, then all of a sudden your sketches are going to start being better and your ideas will be better because you start ad adopting best practices from other people. So I think it's being open-minded, not I'm right yeah. from the beginning. That's great, thanks. Yeah. Can you make this one closer? No, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, Sorry. you spoke before he raised his hand. Something that helps me a lot is like fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And like just consistently focus like how how is this how are what we're creating how's what we're creating best meeting the needs of the person of, like of the, the problem at hand mm -hmm. helps me to be more selfless in my designs rather than be like no this is mine and I know it's good and it's right and we're gonna do it like it helps me to focus more on like the actual problem at hand and let go of all the ego stuff. So when we do portfolio reviews, when people are coming in for a job, we actually look to see how much they focus on the solution rather than what the problem was and how they tried to solve it. Because we found that people who come in to only say, here is the idea and there, here's my visuals and don't ever show you the process, usually can't ideate very well. They get stuck on one idea and that's what they always want to present to you is look at how awesome my idea is. But if someone comes in and they say, here's the problem, we did these kind of processes and we showed all this work, like at the end, I could care less how beautiful it is, if it really solved the needs, because I can see the thought process that goes behind it. So I think that's a great thing, is fall in love with how are you solving for it, not is your solution right. So that's a great point. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, so this isn't directly sketching, but um, I am um, I'm on a marketing team for an on-campus group, and I'm the oh, US cool. guy. Nice. Um, but it's been hard to like get like other people in on kind of the, like the UX like like ideas because I have heard it's often better if kind of everyone's involved in UX and yeah. that kind of thing. Is there anything you might suggest as far as like involving the rest of the group? Because they're, they're like big stakeholders in what we do. Yeah. Um, in designing like the interfaces for like the website where we publish everything. Or, that kind of stuff. Is there anybody like as a junior UX guy, which was a junior guy in the team? Yeah. So marketing departments are always a little more challenging because you usually have a lot of visual people who like to think. But the one thing I, I, I'd love bringing up in those types of situations is someone will have an idea and you know it's stuck in their head and they're trying to get it out. Try and build a culture of, hey, can you sketch that on the board? Can you put that on paper? Provide the utensils, not the utensils, the markers, the tools that they need to really start being able to express themselves. And that's one reason I said with sketching, sometimes it's not just for an interface, it's communicating an idea. So if I, I keep saying to you, it's a left navigation, like how do you not get that? But you said, well go sketch it on the board for me so I can see. Well I put it up and it's actually a top nav, but everything's floated to the left. Like, that's a lot different communication, right? So we may have used different terminology. And so I think as a junior, that's some things you can say is, hey, I'd love to know more about it. Can you maybe sketch on the board so I can understand a little better? And as you do that, you actually engage people in building a culture of sketchers, which is why I originally titled this, was you're trying to get people to become more sketchers, to think with a pen rather than with words or pixels. So. Great.
Any other thoughts? If not, I'm not pressuring you to ask questions. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is jeffcarterux at gmail, so pretty simple. Um, you can, can you ask spell Jeff, like J-E-F-F, -E -F -F, okay. Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R, U-X, at gmail.com. Yep, always open if you guys have questions. If you ever want to come see the office, we love having people come in and check it out. Um, I yeah. missed the beginning. Like, what do you, what's your, where you work? Oh, missed the beginning. Yeah, so, so I work for a company called Infusionsoft. Um, yep. We're based at Chandler, Arizona. We actually have an office here in Utah of 40 people. And it's kind of cool because four of us are designers. Uh, we actually have a UX team of 16 people now. So we range from four researchers, no, sorry, we just hired a fifth, five researchers, 10 designers, and now we just hired a service designer. So definitely have a lot of experience in different types of teams and stuff. So like I say, feel free to reach out with any questions and thanks for letting me come guys. Yeah, thank you.